Okay, in terms of the stuff, the nature may not change, so example two, present assignments part three, current part three, of course, till on April 5th, end of day. Exam 3, Exam 4, Quiz and Assignments Part 4, deadline April 26, end of day. Exam 5, covering all of the stuff, deadlines uh, Wednesday at 5 p.m. on finals week, and that's the stuff. Before pressing on to our next section, namely Part 3, anything about any previous stuff, stuff to be, or stuff that's been, or stuff, 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 that needs more. So now we hop back to chapter two. But as I mentioned before, in previous editions of the textbook, this was chapter eight, so we're on the old organization, but it all makes sense, perhaps. So our objectives in chapter two are this. First, we're gonna go back and look in more in depth at our good friend, the argument, the philosophical argument, which as we'll see, consists of premises and a conclusion, and we'll look at some of the complications and problems that arise from them. Then we'll look at the distinction between the deductive and the inductive, which are the two main families or schools or camps of, of logic, at least in philosophy. And then we'll look at how we assess these arguments. And in the case of deductive arguments, they're valid or invalid, sound or unsound. In the case of inductive arguments, they are strong or weak. We'll also look at arguments that have missing pieces. And arguments can be missing a premise, and they can also, of course, be missing a conclusion. In fact, they can be missing multiple premises. Then we'll look at ethos, pathos, and logos, which sound perhaps like three musketeers or three of the Ninja Turtles, but are not. Then we'll look at the balance of consideration argument, then the uh, inference to a best explanation, or IBE, and then look more at understanding arguments. So two is sort of our lead into arguments, both inductive and deductive, and then we'll proceed from two to inductive reasoning, and then in part four, the final part meaning, we'll look at deductive logic. Now going back to the ancient days of part uh, one, we saw that in philosophy, arguments are not fights or battles or disputes, although they can be included in them, they're attempts to prove a claim. And so none of that's changed. So an argument consists of a conclusion, which answers the question, what's the point? Not in the sense of why are we doing this, but in the sense of what is the author trying to prove or establish? Then the premise is answer the question, what are the reasons or evidence, if any, being offered for that point? So in trying to find them, you lead to the question, what's the point? If there's a point being made, there could be an argument. Then you go to the second question, what reasons or evidence, if any, are being offered? And if there's some reasons or evidence, then you would have an argument. Could be a terrible argument, could be a fallacy, could be good, but that's a need for an argument. Now arguments come in all types of different forms. And as we saw, and we'll see more in the future, they go in the general split of inductive, deductive. And then, of course, the bad ones. Now, to give an example of an argument to a simple deductive one, it's the following uh, form. Now, as we'll see in the future, arguments can be written out you know, just sort of like in normal English, or they can be written out sort of you know, semi-symbolically or fully symbolically. So, for example, Standard deductive argument, kind of symbolically, would look like this. This would be the first premise, if P then Q. Second premise, P, conclusion, therefore Q. And it's a super common uh, deductive argument, and it's called in Latin the modus ponens, or known in English as affirming the antecedent because this is the antecedent, because here it's first, and this part is a consequent, and to affirm it is to say, you know, hey, the, affirm, the antecedent is correct, so you derive the consequent. An example of this would be like this. Uh, if today is Tuesday, then tomorrow is Wednesday. Today is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wednesday. A close cousin of this is
modus tollens, known as denying the consequent. And it's also a good argument. It's of this form. If P is in Q, premise one, not Q, premise two, not P, conclusion. For example, if today is Wednesday, then tomorrow is Thursday. Tomorrow is not Thursday. Today is not Wednesday. That's good logic. And we'll see in part four all kinds of deductive arguments. In theory, there's an infinite possible number of deductive arguments, so we won't go through them all. But as we'll see in a bit, they split into the good ones, valid, like these, and then the bad ones, the invalid, like we'll see in the future. Inductive arguments are the ones we much more commonly use in everyday life. Now the hallmark of um, induction, as we'll see, is probability as opposed to certainty. Deductive arguments, as we'll see in great detail, promise us certainty. So if this is true, this is true, this has got to be true. But inductive arguments deal in likelihood. And we use inductive arguments all the time. For example, spring break is coming up soon, and perhaps you have plans to travel somewhere. And suppose you have a friend who said, oh yeah, you know, I can come pick you, pick you up, take you to the airport, drop you off, no problem. And if your friend has been super reliable all the time, you would make the following, you know, sort of kind of subconscious argument. My friend has been reliable every other time, so they'll show up this time. But of course, it's inductive reasoning because things could go wrong. Maybe they, you know, their car doesn't start, for some reason they forget, or they've been plotting revenge on you for all those years to what happened in first grade, and now they can finally take that revenge, or something else. Another example of uh, inductive reasoning, when we, you know, brand buy. So if you, you know, had the Apple iPhone for a while, and you decide when they come up with their next one that you buy that because your previous iPhones have been good, you're engaged in inductive reasoning. Your argument is, you know, this phone is good, that phone is good, this phone, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, the next phone will be good. But of course, you could be wrong because it could turn out that even though the previous ones were good, the next one could be terrible. Let me give a similar example if you do uh, uh, video gaming. You might have heard a company called BioWare. And they used to make really good games like Bioshock and uh, Dragon Age and stuff. And they came with a game called Anthem. And people were thought, hey, this will be good. They're a great company. They make great games. But inductive argument, of course, because Anthem turned out to be beyond terrible. Exactly. And so that would be inductive reasoning. Also, as a final example, see more of this in the future, causal reasoning, figuring out how things work. So, for example, if you, you're trying to print your paper on, on your laptop and it can't, doesn't print, it just goes to the print uh, you know, queue and just won't print, you'll have to figure out like what went wrong. And that would involve causal reasoning. So you'd consider, as we'll see in the future, what changed. For example, maybe you can't connect to the Wi-Fi. Your printer's a Wi-Fi printer. You're like, okay, why can't I connect? And then you find out that you know, someone's changed the password to the Wi-Fi. Well, causal reasoning would be, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi. It's a Wi-Fi printer. The, the password has been changed. Therefore, that's the problem. And that would be good inductive reasoning. So those are all kinds of examples of arguments, and we'll see many more in the future. <clears throat> now, one feature of, um, of arguments is you can extend them. Now, as I mentioned with arguments, you can only have one conclusion and unlimited premises. And so this may seem to break the rule, namely that you can't have an argument with multiple conclusions. But it actually fits the rule. It's not an exception that breaks that, that proves the rule. It, it's a rule that sticks with the rule. Because the idea is this. If you're building an extended argument, you would not like have multiple conclusions. But what you do is you take the conclusion of one argument and then recycle or reuse it as the premise for another argument. So you would have you know, argument one here, and then you'd build argument two, and instead of having you know, multiple conclusions, you would just have, say, the conclusion of this argument, 
working as a premise in this one. So, for example, you might have an argument um, in favor of developing AI, and the first argument might lead to the conclusion that AI would be extremely profitable. That's the conclusion of the first one. And then you could reuse that as, as a premise in the second argument, you know, something like, if AI is extremely profitable, then we should use it. It's extremely profitable, therefore we should develop it. And so you've got an extended argument, but the conclusion is being used in this place as a premise, so you don't have two conclusions in one argument, you have two arguments, each one's got a conclusion, but there's a connection, because this conclusion gets reused as a premise. To use an analogy, it's kind of like with a car. As a general rule, you should only have one person driving the car. Unlike arguments, you get multiple people driving the wheel. But of course, a person could be the driver you know, of one car, and then become the passenger for another. And you're still sticking with the, there can only be one driver rule, it's just that the same you know, to use the metaphor, the same person is driving this car, but a passenger here. Same person, different car. And the same with the arguments. You can take the, you can reach a conclusion, then use the next argument, and you can keep on going, just extending the argument on and on. Now, the advantage of extending an argument is that you can build, you know, a, a long logical chain. It's kind of like setting up um, one metaphor, like building a building. You keep you know, constructing it, you build a big, big building. Or if you want to use a more you know, problematic analogy, you can also see it as the weak point. Namely, it's like building up a house of cards, because same kind of problem. If you have you know, a structure built of cards or dominoes, you tap one, the whole thing goes. So the advantage of extending the argument is, is you can you know, keep on building an argument. And from the standpoint of like doing, I guess, logic tricks, I guess it'd be kind of not really cool, but interesting to see how far you can build an argument. But the weak point again is like the domino. If the first argument is taken out, then everything depending on it gets taken out too. So if you're writing a paper and you've got like three arguments, and each one builds on the next, but the first one, you know, is terrible, you know, gets taken out then the rest kind of collapse. So that's kind of the weak point. So on the side of building arguments, the advantage is you can build you know, a pretty extensive logical structure. So if you have a complicated point to make or prove, you might have to go and do it, you know, a series of connected arguments. In terms of defending it or attacking it, again, the weak point is if you have, say, five arguments that are just form one big extended argument, taking out the first one can collapse the whole thing, so it's more, more vulnerable. Now, in addition to be able to be extended, you can have arguments with missing pieces. And we'll see more of this in the future. Now, not saying the premise means that the premise is, well, not stable. So when the person presents the argument, speaking, writing, etc., they leave it out. Same with the conclusion. The conclusion is left out. Now there is a kind of a theoretical or abstract question here, namely, how much can you leave out and still have an argument? To use a metaphor, it's kind of like, um, how much can you leave out of a cake or an omelet and still have an omelet? Well, in the case of an omelet, you got to at least have like eggs and probably something in it. I guess I guess you could have like an omelet with nothing, just folded over you know, eggs. But you have to have at least like eggs. Same with an argument. Kind of the question would be, well, how much could you not have there? Could someone give like a single letter and say, oh, it's an argument. I just didn't state all the parts. Now, from a practical standpoint, it would be a matter of is there enough there for you know, a person, a sensible person, to recognize there's an argument going on. And then there's kind of the abstract theoretical question of, kind of like the omelet question, what's the absolute minimum you could have and still have an argument? Because you can take almost any sentence and then imagine, you know, adding stuff to it to build an argument. So kind of the question is, how much do you have to, would you have to add on your own to make it an argument? 
Now, on uh, exams, quizzes, assignments, etc., to avoid that kind of abstract stuff, if there's missing pieces, it will be not like super, super obvious, but it'll be clear that there's something missing and there'll be you know, a pretty reasonable way to find out what should go there. So why do people leave out pieces? Well, one reason is, you know, tests and quizzes, etc. But in um, you know, a practical context, one common reason is, as you might expect, is if you've ever, you know, ordered, you know, a hamburger or something and you're missing, you know, like the lettuce and the tomato, it's just the person forgot. So sometimes people are kind of sloppy or forget, and they just leave chunks up. So they're building an argument, and for whatever, you know, for whatever reason, um, they don't bother, they don't care, just forgot, a chunk is left up. In that case, it's not malice, it's just they forgot. And you have to kind of figure out what should have been there. In other cases, people leave out the premise or conclusion because it's just really obvious. You might think there's no reason to, to include it. For example, if you take the Tuesday-Wednesday argument, if someone says, you know, today is Tuesday, therefore tomorrow is Wednesday, the missing and obvious premise is, is that Wednesday follows Tuesday. And it may be left out just because it's obvious. Or the conclusion might be left out. Someone might say, if today is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wednesday, today is Tuesday, and then the obvious conclusion is tomorrow is Wednesday. And it can be left out because it's just obvious. Now the problem there with leaving out the obvious is that what's obvious to one may not be obvious to all. Australian philosophers, for some reason, were really big on doing this, especially this fellow David Armstrong, and he would write an argument and leave out chunks and just say things like, it's obvious which way the cat will jump on this one, or it's obvious what the boys in the back room will be having. It's like, what does that even, even mean? But if you talk to him, you can fill in the, the pieces. But what seems obvious to one may not to everybody. So that can be kind of a risk to leave pieces out. Now sometimes people leave out the conclusion or because of audience involvement. So if someone's speaking and they're you know, leading the audience to draw a conclusion, they may leave it out in the hopes that the audience will supply it and buy into it, feel like they're participating, so they'll want to, want to accept it. A final reason to leave stuff out, especially premises, is sort of a, well, a sinister or malicious reason. It might be that the premise that's missing might be just terrible. And if a person you know, recognized and saw the premise that was really there, they would say, hey, that's a terrible premise, this is a lousy argument. But if it's left out, kind of oddly enough, not saying that might be better than saying it. Because the person might just kind of you know, accept the argument and not realize that an important piece is left out, and that piece is terrible. Or the piece may be something offensive or insulting, etc., and they may leave it out so they can kind of use innuendo. You know, so that way, people kind of in the know will get the argument, but people who aren't in the know won't realize what's going on, and they can say, oh, I didn't mean that, I didn't actually say that. So there can be just just being sloppy, thinking it's obvious, and also sometimes, you know, sinister or malicious reasons to leave stuff up. Now, in general, if you want to clearly convey your arguments, it's best to include all the the stuff. Now, there may again, there may be cases where it may be so obvious that you wouldn't put it in there, or again, you may want the audience to draw draw a conclusion. But in general, it's best to have all the stuff, at least from a you know, philosophical standpoint. Before pressing on, anything about this stuff that needs more stuff. Now, as I mentioned, there are two main flavors of arguments. These are the deductive arguments and the inductive. And we'll look at inductive arguments in depth in this section and deductive arguments and depths in part four.
So do doctor arguments we saw work like this? They're arguments. So to spot one, here's how you go about the spotting. The first question to ask is when you're, if you're looking at something and you're, your objective is to find arguments, you first again want to lead with the question, is there a point being made? If the answer is yes, then the next question is, are there premises, you know, reasons and evidence being offered? If the answer is yes, then you've got a argument. Now once you find an argument, the next question is, what type is it? And here's how you find out. There are two questions. One is, does this argument purport to offer me an argument in which the premises provide, or supposedly provide, complete support for the conclusion? Now, in some cases, if it's a good deductive argument, it'll be clear that it's a deductive argument, because it will it will be obviously being what it is. If it's kind of a defective deductor argument, it can get kind of mucky. But sort of the, you know, the question once you decide an argument is, are the premises supposed to provide complete support? If the answer is yes, you've got a deductive argument. If the answer is no, inductive. So what do I mean by complete support? So what are you looking for? Well. A good deductive argument is one in which the premises support the conclusion. In the case of deductive arguments, their kind of special thing is being valid. Now, valid is pretty simply defined, but it's a definition that is, despite being so direct and simple, can be quite confusing. And here's why. Valid means that an argument is such that if all of the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. And the reason why it tends to you know, mislead people or confuse people is because it's got a conditional in there, you know, an if-then statement. So one thing that people often do is they'll hear it as, no, if all the premises are true, the conclusion must be true they'll kind of remember it as true premises, true conclusion. Because that's easier to remember the conditional. But unfortunately, that would be totally wrong. Because validity isn't about it being true, it's about if it were true. To use um, a couple analogies, and this is going back to part one, where we separate out good logic from good content. And validity is Nice to illustrate this. So a valid argument is one in which if all the premises were true, the conclusion would have to be true, whether the premises really are true or not. So part of the confusion factor is, weirdly, you can have a valid argument, and the parts could all be false, which seems kind of weird. Well, or they could all be true, which doesn't feel weird. And you could have a mix, which is weird. The only thing you couldn't have is all true premises and a false conclusion. Now, to use a couple metaphors or analogies to illustrate this, you can think of, uh, oh, tax season is coming up. I guess if the government's over. I guess if there's no government, then I'm not sure how it works. Probably no taxes. You can think metaphorically or by analogy, that the tax, if you use tax software, then you can think of the tax software as a deductive argument. In fact, you can think of it that way because it's supposed to be a deductive argument and a valid one. And of course, it's very complicated because if you used you know, TurboTax or HRF Block or other software, you put in all kinds of stuff. And But the idea is, what well, they promise is this. If you put in all your correct tax information, your W-2s, your 1099s, your deductions, etc. what they promise is at the end, you'll get the right conclusion. That if all the premises are correct, you type in everything correctly and true, you'll get what you owe or what you are owed. Now, the program doesn't promise you that if you put in anything, you'll get true. 
because what it says is essentially, you know, roughly put, if you put in all true stuff, they promise to give you the right amount. What happens if you just start making up stuff? Income, ten billion dollars. Uh, they don't make any any guarantees. So if someone, you know, if I put in like ten, you know, put in my income, or well, one person did this, <laughs> they actually got lots of money back. They put in like an income of like twenty five thousand. I think they put in, um, they paid a million dollars in taxes, and they just cut the check <laughs> without. They eventually caught. So, but if I you know did that income, ten thousand dollars, taxes paid ten billion, money owed by the government nine billion dollars. Now of course the program would accept all of that and send that off to the. I mean hopefully the flag and say you should probably think that, but it'd go off to the IRS. Now if I get audited, which I should in that case. I can't complain to you know, Intuit or HR Block because their promise is not our tax software just always gives you the right answer no matter what. It's that if you put in the right stuff, they get the right result. Now, if I did put in all the right stuff and there's a programming error and it, it gets it wrong, then that's on, on them. But if I just make stuff up and throw it in there, that's on me. And deductive arguments, they work the same way. Deductive argument says, you know, hey there, I'm deducting. You give me truth, I'll give you truth. You give me non-truth, no guarantees. No guarantees at all. But you give me truth, I give you truth. It's like a good, literally like a good program. Or another example would be like, um, another metaphor would be like uh, plumbing or pipes in a house. A good deductive argument would be like having all your pipes properly connected so if water goes in the right place, you know, it comes out like in the shower, as opposed to coming out in the ceiling, running into your TV set. And so, if you put all the pipes in the right places, the idea is if water goes in, it comes out of the shower. But if you never put any water in, then there's no, you won't get anything out. Or if you put in something terrible <laughs> in there, uh, you know, pour in like dirt or rocks, well, there's no guarantee it's going to come out because the what the what the plumber says if I'll put in the pipes correctly, so if water goes in there, it comes out in the right place. If someone decides to put rocks or dirt or scorpions in there, no, no promises. <clears throat> to illustrate, it, it seems pretty clear if you put actual true stuff, like the day of the week thing. If today is Tuesday, then tomorrow is Wednesday, that's true. Today is Tuesday, true, unless we're in like a time warp or something. And so tomorrow is Wednesday, assuming tomorrow arrives. So if this is true, this is true, this has got to be true. Makes good sense. Now, this is still good logic, even when the stuff here is false. To give a non-silly example, think about uh, tomorrow. If I gave this argument tomorrow, if today is Tuesday, then tomorrow is Wednesday, if today is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wednesday, the logic would still be good. But the problem would be, of course, is that on Wednesday, it wouldn't be Tuesday anymore. So this premise would be false, because on Wednesday, it's not going to be Tuesday. And this would be false, because on Wednesday, it's Wednesday. Tomorrow's not going to be the Wednesday. But the logic is still good logic. Just like with you know, the tax program, if someone just makes up stuff, you know, the program can still be working fine. Oh, third and final example, think about the uh, word problems back, you know, way back in uh, grade school, junior high or something. And they always had, you know, train A is heading towards city C, train B is heading towards city C at so many miles per hour, blah, blah, blah. You know, what time do they meet or whatever. Now in that case, there need not be any train or city, it's all made up, but you can still do your math correctly, even with just made up numbers. Or with other word problems like calculating mortgages, etc. So deductive logic being valid just means that if it were all true, the logic would guarantee the conclusion is true. And again, it doesn't have to be true. Like, to use a, you know, to use a silly example, if Bill is unicorn and Bill's got a horn, Bill is unicorn and Bill's got a horn, good logic. But of course, this is not true, and that's not true because there are no unicorns. Logic is still good, though. So you can have good logic with terrible content. 
So if you know an argument is valid, you know that if it's got all true premise, is it's got to have a true conclusion. But you don't know if the premises are actually true or not. So you get a valid argument with false premises and a false conclusion. You get a valid argument with a mix of true and false premises and a false conclusion or even a true conclusion. The only thing you couldn't have is a valid argument with all true premises and a false conclusion. Because that would be impossible. Before anything too invalid, anything about valid that needs more valid stuff. Or anything about unicorn. Invalid is basically a defective deductive argument. Formal definition, similar to valid, but works like this. An invalid deductive argument is an argument that could have all true premises and have a false conclusion at the same time. Now the important wording there is could, because weirdly enough, and this is what throws people off, invalid doesn't mean false. It just means you could have all true premises and a false conclusion. You could have an invalid argument in which everything is true. It would still be bad logic, but it, everything in there could be correct. So validity and invalidity, which throws people off, don't tell you whether the premises or conclusion are true or not. It just tells you how the logic would work. A valid argument means that if you put in true premises, you're guaranteed a true conclusion. Invalid argument means you could put in all true premises, and you might get a false conclusion. You might get a true one, but you might get a false one. And that's the problem. So to illustrate and also to metaphor again, we take an example of a classic invalid argument. It's known as affirming the consequent and it's the evil twin of affirming the antecedent. Because, of course, this is the antecedent, consequent, here's it being affirmed, and this is bad logic. It's invalid. And again, the reason why it's invalid is not because it always gives you a false conclusion, but because you could have this be true, this be true, this be false. But, and here's the thing that throws people off, you can have an invalid argument where everything is true but the logic is still bad. And first I'll give an example, and then I'll give a metaphor. Here's my usual example. If Tallahassee is the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida, which is totally true. Tallahassee, of course, is in Florida, and Tallahassee is the capital. So everything I've said is true. And it seems appealing, because some might say, yeah, all that's true seems Seems legitimate to me, seems like good logic. But even though everything I said is true, it's actually bad logic. But the reason why people tend to you know, fall for it is because it feels kind of sensible. You know, if P is in Q, Q there for P, Taos is the capital of Florida, it's in Florida, Taos is in Florida, it's the capital, seems to kind of connect. But of course, if you really kind of think about it, you can see that there's something you know, sketchy going on that there's something wrong there. And one way to test it is, see if you can make this true and this true and make this false. And if you can, then there's something wrong with it, which is one of the ways to test for invalidity. So for example, this would be easy to test, because the reasoning is, if something is the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida. So if it's in Florida, it's the capital. So we can take anything in Florida and plug it in here, right? If Soft Chop is the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida. Totally true. Soft Choppy is in Florida. Soft Choppy is the capital. Not true. You could use um, Miami. If Miami is the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida. Miami is in Florida. Miami is the capital. And you can just keep going with all the stuff in Florida. But of course, that doesn't work. So we can see this logic is bad. It's invalid. Now, switching to the metaphor. Think of um, you know, going back to the tax software. Suppose there's a considerably cheaper program called um, uh, TurTax <laughs> uh, that says we get it right maybe some of the time. And so if you put in all your stuff, eh, maybe it gives the right answer, maybe it doesn't. And of course, that would be 
terribly. I mean, it may, it may give the correct answer, but of course you want something that guarantees the correct answer. So going with metaphor, an invalid argument is like a defective program in which you could put in correct stuff, but still get a wrong answer. So think of like, um, another example, if you ever uh, worked in Excel or similar spreadsheets, you have to do the formulas, etc. And if you get like a formula wrong, and you put in the right, right stuff, and it <coughs> does, the, you know, does it wrong, you get the wrong answer. And sometimes it may luck out, because sometimes you may not, not catch it, and you put in the stuff, and it's like, oh, it worked, and worked on this, so I guess it's great. But then when you go and try it in something else, it's like, wait, it's not, not working. So you can think of using the computer metaphor, deductive arguments are good programs, you know, bug free, when they're valid. And if they have bugs where they don't always work, they're invalid. And once again, the, the thing that people often get, get caught up in, because it seems so reasonable, is thinking valid means true and invalid means false. But no connection. Valid arguments just mean if all the premises are true, the truth of the conclusion is guaranteed. With an invalid argument, you can put in all true premises, but the truth of the conclusion is not guaranteed. You could still end up with something not true. Before pressing on, anything with um, valid and invalid, it needs more stuff. Or anything, any other terrible metaphors. Now, as you might imagine, we want arguments not just to be good logic, we also want to have true stuff in there. To go back to the tax software analogy, when you're doing your taxes, or if you're having someone do your taxes for you, you don't want them to just say, uh, yeah, I used the right, I did my math right. They'd be like, that's good, but did you put in the right stuff? And you want them to just say, yeah, I put in the correct stuff. You'd also want to know, did they do their math correctly? So what if it's got good logic and there's actually true stuff in there? Well, that becomes the greatest argument of all, the platinum standard in logic, the sound deductive argument. Now, being sound is pretty tough. In order to be sound, an argument has to be valid, and it also has to have all true premises. So to tell, you would say, well, is it valid? And then the next question would be, are all those premises actually true? If the answer is yes, they're all true, then it's sound, which by definition, because sound means valid, all true premises. Now, you get for free, so to speak, a true conclusion, because if the argument is valid and it's got all true premises, by definition, you get a true conclusion. Now, validity is eternal and forever. So is invalidity. If an argument is valid, it was valid before the beginning of time, and it'll be valid after the end of time, if there is such a thing. Same with an invalid argument. If an argument is invalid, it has always been and always shall be invalid. Nothing ever changes that. So yesterday, tomorrow, 10 billion years from now, modus uh, ponens will still be valid. Now, soundness, though, can change from day to day, from moment to moment. And the reason why is because soundness requires that all the premises actually be true and the argument be valid. So the validity will never change. So a sound argument is always going to be valid, but it may go from being sound one day to not being sound the next, or even moment to moment. To illustrate, think of the day of the week argument. The Tuesday-Wednesday argument is always valid. It's always good logic. So, for example, if you um, you know are on some shipwreck and you're not sure like whether you're unconscious for a while and you're stuck on an island with no phone or clock and you have no idea what day it is, you might just say, "Well, uh, I don't know how, I've, how long I've been out, but let's guess not a full day." So, you know, last thing I remember it was Tuesday. So today is Wednesday now because the day after Tuesday is Wednesday. And you could turn out to be wrong. Maybe you were unconscious for a couple days, but that would be good logic. You don't have to know the day of the week to know if the logic is good. But you do have to 
know the day of the week to know if the argument is settled. Because the Tuesday Wednesday argument is valid every day of the week, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap years. And, but it's only, of course, sound on Tuesdays. Because only Tuesdays are Tuesdays. So if today is Tuesday and tomorrow is Wednesday, today is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wednesday, valid every day, sound only on Tuesdays. The argument, if today is Monday, then tomorrow is Tuesday, today is Monday, tomorrow is Tuesday, it's valid right now, valid every day of the week. But of course it's not sound today, because today is not Monday. So soundness can vary, again, moment to moment, day to day. Now, if an argument is valid, but its premises are not all true, then it's unsound, but still, but still valid. So the, the day of the week arguments, they're only valid, they're valid every day, but only sound on their, their day. The Tuesday argument was sound on Tuesday, Monday argument was sound on Monday, etc. So an argument could shift from being sound to unsound. Now, if an argument is invalid, then it's always unsound. Because valid, um, valid plus all true premises mean sound. Invalid, always unsound. So if you know an argument is sound, you know a whole bunch about it. You know that it's valid, it's deductive, it's an argument. You know it's got all true premises. You know it's got a true conclusion. So that tells you all kinds of stuff. If you know an argument is valid, you know it's deductive, it's an argument. And if it had all true premises, it would have a true conclusion. But you don't know if the premises are true. You don't know if the conclusion is true. You just know that if all the premises were true, the conclusion would have to be true. But you don't know anything beyond that. If an argument is unsound, well, could be valid, could be invalid. It's deductive. It's an argument. Um, maybe it's got false premises. Maybe it doesn't. You, you don't know. So if it's unsound, if you know it's unsound, you don't know a whole bunch about it because there's all kinds of ways it could, could be. So sound tells you the most. Unsound doesn't tell you too much. I mean, you do know that it's, it's either going to be valid or invalid. It's going to have true premises or not have true premises, so don't know a whole bunch. So that's the deductive side of the, of the tree. Critical concepts here are, of course, Argument, deductive, valid, sound, unsound, and invalid. Now, they don't have a separate name for being unsound, for being invalid. It would just be an invalid argument that's unsound. I guess maybe they should have another chart. So unsound applies to, to this. Also, when you have a valid argument with one or more false premises. Okay, before pressing on, anything about this that needs more... Now we'll see much more deductive arguments in the future, in part four. And there's an entire other course, the logic class, that is mostly the deductive stuff. So if you can't get enough, the deductive stuff is always the logic class. Also, uh, finding mathematics and circuit design courses, all deductive logic. Inductive arguments. We'll spend, as I mentioned before, the, once we get out of chapter two, the rest of the next two chapters will be about inductive argument. So we'll be living the land of induction for this part three. Now, inductive arguments, they are arguments. So if you're trying to spot one, again, it's, you'd be with the, the usual questions. Is there a point? If the answer is yes, you'd ask, are there reasons or evidence being given? If the answer is yes, you get an argument. The next question would be, is it you know, trying to give me certainty or trying to just give probability or likelihood? If it's trying to give us certainty, then again, deductive. If it's trying to give us probability or likelihood, then inductive. Now, I didn't mention, but I will now, we, we looked at uh, fallacies. So the question might be, where do fallacies go on here? Well, would the deductive arguments, the invalid arguments, those are fallacies. B 
because a uh, invalid deductive argument would be a deductive fallacy. And every invalid argument would be a fallacy because by definition it's bad logic. In theory, there's an infinite number of these bad arguments, so we're not going to look at them all. Now, we will see in the future, and we've seen already, a couple examples of the deductive fallacies. Affirming the uh, consequent is one of them, you know, bad logic. Now, the fallacies that we saw in the you know, previous section were inductive fallacies, things like ad hominems, etc. So we've seen a lot of bad inductive arguments. And now we'll see some good ones, but also some more bad ones. So if the argument says essentially to you, hi there, I'm an argument, I got my premises, got my conclusion, but my premises only give probable support to my conclusion, then it'd be an inductive argument. Now, strictly speaking, all inductive arguments are invalid. Just like, strictly speaking, uh, automobiles don't make good subways. Even though they're all vehicles, automobiles are not designed to do that. So if you're buying, you know, if you were ever selling a car and someone said, uh, how well does this go underwater? If they were serious, they don't understand, you know, how cars are supposed to, supposed to work. Unless they've seen a lot of James Bond. So inductive arguments are always technically invalid, but they're not trying to be. Just like, you know, again, for example, a car doesn't make a great submarine or airplane because that's not what they're designed to do. So once you get the inductive arguments sorted out, the question then is, is it good or bad? And here's how you tell. Inductive arguments, since they're all technically valid, they, we don't assess them that way because there'd be no point because you just say, oh, they're all valid, but they're not trying to do that. They're divided into strong and weak. But it's more of a, even though I've got, you know, a bipolar split there, it's more of a spectrum. So the strong or weakness is not just like, it's absolutely strong or absolutely weak, like valid or invalid. There are degrees. So there's a spectrum going from you know, zero support, total fallacy, to as strong as strong could be, which would be like 99.999%. Because if you got to 100% you know, support, you'd be a deductive argument. So deductive arguments are strictly binary. You get 100% support, or you get zero, or nothing. With inductive arguments, it's like 99.9 .9 to infinity, down to zero, and all the stuff in between. Now, a strong inductive argument is one in which the premises provide considerable support for the conclusion. A weak one is where the premises do not supply enough support for the conclusion. And you can use a, um, a metaphor for like the supports for a table, or a bridge, or the foundation of a building you know, they have to be strong enough to hold it up. And if they're not, it collapses. Same with the arguments, metaphorically speaking. If the logic is not strong enough, the argument collapses. It can't support the conclusion. Now, in some cases, as we'll see in the future, you can quite literally put a number on how confident you can be in the argument. Because you, you know, if you're dealing with statistics, then you can lay out actual numbers and say the argument is, you know, 95% or 82%. For example, suppose that 80% uh, of humans have brown eyes. I think that's true or feels true, truish. So if we were betting on the eye color of the next person to come through those doors, we would bet brown. Because there's an 80% chance it would be right. And it would be a strong argument because we have a good chance. All right, <laughs> we have a good chance of being right because if we go by you know, eight percent of the brown eyes, and there we go. So that would be a strong argument. Now, if you're going the opposite and saying the person doesn't have brown eyes, it'd be a pretty weak argument because their chance of being right would only be twenty percent. 
So in cases of actual statistics, when you got you know, numbers, you can actually say, okay, here's some, some numbers. Now the question then is, how strong is strong? Well, this is where the line drawing fallacy that we saw you know, recently comes into play. We really can't draw an exact definitive line to say, okay, if it's not 80, no good. Now we could say, okay, you know, 50%, then no, because it's likely to be wrong is right. But what about 72.5? Maybe. Um, clearly 99.9, .9, yeah, that's clearly strong, 95 clearly strong, and so there's kind of a gray area. Now, we can't always say what the exact line is, but fortunately don't always have to. In fact, there's two ways to work around it. One is, we don't have to give an exact number, but we can kind of say, okay, that's, you know, kind of gauge that it's, you know, strong enough or too weak. The second kind of work around is to go by either, well, it's actually, this would kind of make it three workarounds. One is that in certain professional fields, they specify using, you know, precise in definition, what is, what is needed. So for example, as we'll see in the future, for controlled cause-effect experiments, for most professional grade polls and surveys, the gold standard is 95%, which means that if you, you know, if you do the survey, 95 out of 100 surveys like that would get a, a correct result. Or if you do a control cause to effect experiment, there's a 95% chance it's not due just to the difference. It's not just due to random chance. So in those cases, by the decision of people that make such decisions, they made that kind of professional standard. Now, in other contexts, it'd be a matter of kind of a value judgment. Namely, how much strength do you require? To use an analogy, think of um, if you were doing uh, some climb. Different people have different tolerances for like risk in terms of like how much safety gear they have to have. So for some people to feel confident and safe, they would want like, you know, the full climbing rig, they would want to make sure the rope is like new and not thin and went out, and they'd want like, you know, the helmet and all that stuff. So they would, for that purpose, they'd want, metaphorically speaking, they'd want a really strong, you know, uh, support. Other people, you know, would want, don't need as much. They'd be like, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, we have like a rope or no, heck with a rope on this, you know, free climb or something. And so it's a matter of value judgment in terms of how strong is strong enough. So in practical context, it would depend, just like with, with climbing or doing anything, what is at stake and what are the, you know, in terms of the consequences of the gains, and what is your tolerance for, for risk. And this can vary quite a bit. So for example, think a simple case. Suppose uh, you go to Publix and you, you see a cereal on sale, it's on BOGO, and you remember a friend of yours saying, hey, the cereal's, you know, really good. And, you know, you never heard it before, your friend says it's good, you look at the ingredients and you think you like them. In that case, it, it wouldn't be like a super strong argument because you're going by, your, my friend said it was good, um, it's similar to a cereal I like, so I'm not like 95% sure, but I'm pretty sure, let's say 70%. In that case, if the cereal is like a dollar a box and you're not, you know, you've got some money, you might say, well, that's good enough. That argument is strong enough for my, my purposes. Now, if it was something like um, you saw they're doing like medical experimentation, they want volunteers, uh, and they go and they say, yeah, there's a, you know, there's a 40% chance that this will kill you, <laughs> you know, 60% chance that it won't, you may say, well, that's not, that's not strong enough. I need, I need a lower chance of, of death. So in that case, if a lot is at stake, like your life and well-being, then you'd want more, more confidence. Or another example, like if you're, um, you know, buying, you know, herbal supplements or something on Amazon, and they claim that it, you know, helps with arthritis. In that case, um, 
and it probably, you know, if it's something that is known to be, at worst, harmless, then you wouldn't have to have like a super high confidence. But again, if it's something like dangerous or can kill you, you'd want more more confidence. So the point of that essentially is, in terms of judging how strong is strong enough, again, it's basically three things. One is, in a professional context, the people who make those decisions, you know, set the standard in science, they, they say, you know, to be adequately scientific study, it's got to be this or survey. The second thing, of course, is the um, uh, a person's value judgment, their level of you know risk tolerance. Um, so those are kind of the main the main things. Professional set standard, and then basically a matter of value judgments. What kind of risk can you are you willing to to tolerate? Now, because of that, again, there's no there's no like exact definition or standard for exactly what's strong enough, and it will vary from context to, to context. Now before, um, oh, last thing. The book doesn't mention this, but I'll include it for, for free. The inductive equivalent to sound is cogent. And cogent means strong, plus it's actually got true and again, just like with soundness, an argument's cogency may vary from context to context. So the strength of an argument is a function of how well the premise is for the conclusion, and the cogency would be, do I actually, you know, is it a strong argument? Yeah, if the answer is yes, the premises are true, then it would be cogent. And of course, there would be degrees of cogency, you know, more or less based on the strength. So, a couple good questions would be, why do we use these, and how do we use them? Now, given that deductive arguments give us certainty, and if we had a sound argument, we would know that it was giving us the truth, why would anybody use inductive reasoning? Now, in fact, some dead, and not only dead when they were alive, and currently living philosophers, notice this feature of deductive arguments. Our good dead friend Rene Descartes, he, uh, when he was doing his math stuff, he um, realized that if you have an argument that's deductive and you put in true stuff, you always get true stuff. And he looked at the question of how can we know anything with certainty? So he looked around at science and philosophy and said, we have all this stuff, but it's all uncertain. We just can't be, we can't be sure. And what he wanted to do was essentially bulldoze all the uncertain stuff and dig until he found an absolutely certain foundation on which he could build up science and philosophy with absolute certainty. And he thought he could do this with deductive logic. And his plan was this. If he could find truths that were self-evidently true, as I say, as soon as you knew them, you knew they were true, then he could plug those into deductive arguments, creating sound arguments, get a guaranteed true conclusion, and then you could keep building more, more truth. So his plan was eventually to answer the questions of everything with deductive logic. And he wrote a famous uh, work called Meditations on First Philosophy. He didn't succeed, of course, because otherwise he'd be saying, Descartes found us all the truth and we know everything, but it was a good effort, as they say. So then, given that absolute certainty could be yielded by sound arguments, why settle for less? Well, as the Descartes project kind of indicated, because uh, we have to, because getting that kind of certainty to work, it kind of doesn't. Maybe you want to see more about why it doesn't work is the epistemology class, where we see why that doesn't work. Also, as you might imagine, most of life is deductive, I mean, sorry, inductive, and here's why. It is both the curse and reason why we have to use induction. And here's how it goes. Another dead philosopher, before he was dead, our good dead friend, David Hume, realized something about inductive reasoning, which is this. All inductive reasoning, regardless of its type, involves making a, a leap. And the leap is this. Here's what you've observed or what you know or think you know. 
And with an inductive argument, you're always going beyond your premises. You're making the inductive leap. So you're leaping to a conclusion. And the problem is, of course, whenever you make that leap, just like you make any leap, you might not make it. So as you pointed out, whenever we go beyond what we've observed or we haven't, we can always be wrong. So this is the problem of induction, which is whenever you go from beyond what you've observed or what you know to what you don't know or haven't observed, you can always be wrong. Now here's the reason why we have to do this. Because in general, we have imperfect and incomplete information. So in most of life, we do have to make that jump. We don't have all the information, so we can't make a deductive argument. We have to do induction. So the reason why we use it is also its problem. Namely, we don't have all the information, so we have to use induction. And since we don't have all the information and we're using induction, we can always, always be wrong. Which is why no matter how careful you are, like in the sciences, or doing surveys and polls, you can always be wrong. But it's in a way unavoidable. If we had per perfect information and perfect logic, we'd be fine. But we don't, don't have either. So that's why we use it, because the easy answer is because we got it. Then the question is, how do we use it? What are ways we make use of this? Well, as I mentioned, inductive arguments are something we use all the time. And until you've like heard of inductive arguments, you wouldn't realize you were using them, but we're using them all the time. And here are common ways we use them. The first way is what's called generalizing. And what we do is we go from what we've observed and we draw a conclusion about what we have not observed. So we get a sample from the population that we've observed and we extend it to the whole population. Now, in everyday life, we do this all the time. For example, if we um, meet people from a certain you know, country and they're kind of annoying and rude, we might generalize to the whole population, say, my, aren't those you know, French people rude? Or aren't those Canadians nice? More formally, it's also used in surveys and polls. You might recall back in 2016, their surveys said, you know, for the presidential election, predicted that Hillary Clinton would win. And then, of course, people said, oh, we can't trust, you know, these polls anymore, they're terrible. But actually, as, you know, sensible people said, yeah, we need to always reconsider our polls, but the polls could have been perfectly fine because whatever you're doing an inductive argument, going from your sample to generalize to the whole, it's an inductive leap. Things can always be wrong. So there's nothing wrong with generalizing, in fact, you'd expect them to be to go wrong occasionally. So we generalize both in our everyday life from our, our experiences. I'm going to get another example. If you go to a chain restaurant and it's terrible, you'd probably generalize and say, well, I'm not going to any of these again because this one's terrible, so they're all terrible. And of course, we also use them more formally for things like surveys, etc. And with the 2020 election coming up, we're going to see these constantly in the news. You know, all the polls for the primaries and then for the presidential election. We also use analogies. Now we saw the rhetorical analogy, comparing things, saying that someone is as treacherous as a weasel or is you know, bold as a now, in terms of an argument by analogy, you'll see more of this in the future, it's when we say that two things are alike in certain ways, so they're alike in this other way we're concerned with. A good example of this we've probably all done is brand buying. Or, you know, for example, um, if you like the music of a particular band or singer and their new album is coming out, you might decide to buy it or listen, at least listen to it by reasoning by analogy. I like their previous albums. I will like this one because it's like the previous ones. 
but as you probably encounter in life, sometimes things can be very disappointing. You know, the previous albums were good, or the previous books or movies were good, and this one is terrible. And we'll see more about analogies in the future. We also engage in reasoning about the future, really enough. So, for example, we believe that if you put popcorn or you know popcorn kernels in the microwave and you know, put it in time, you'll get popcorn. We don't think that microwaves cool things down. If you want things to be colder, you put them in a refrigerator or freezer. So we reason about what will happen in the future based on what happened in the past. Now, as Hume pointed out, and as you know, if you ever hear commercials for investment companies, you know, past performance is no indication of future performance. When we leap from what we've observed, the past, the future may be quite different, quite surprising, either disappointingly so, terrifyingly so, or maybe good, maybe a good surprise. But in order to reason about the future, we haven't been there yet, so we have to use induction. We have to say, okay, this is what I've seen so far, so the future will be the same. And again, a practical example of this, when um, if you're planning on traveling for spring break, and you want to get a ride to the airport, you would think of your friends and think of which ones are reliable. And you'd pick your most reliable friend based on their past behavior. So they've always been dependable and reliable, you pick them. If you have a friend who you know, never shows up on time, is terrible and terribly reliable, you don't pick them because you're going on past behavior. But of course, the future can always turn out to be different from the past. We'll also look Fourthly, at causal reasoning, how stuff works. And we'll look at this in sort of two scopes. One level is the level we do every day, and that is individual causation. For example, if you go to turn on your iPhone and it doesn't turn on, it just stays off. Well, in that case, you got to figure out why is that happening so you can get back to you know, phony stuff. Or if your car doesn't start, you'll want to know why is your car not starting. Or if you, um, you know, do a 5K or play tennis or something, and he starts bothering you, you want to know what the cause was. Or you know, what you can do to, to fix it. And you'll be engaging in causal reasoning. What is causing this particular thing? Now there's also what's called causation in populations. For example, you often hear from um, the FDA and nutritionists, et cetera, talking about how, for example, that uh, bacon is unhealthy or processed meats cause cancer. Now when they say that, they don't mean that if you eat bacon, you'll get cancer. What they mean is, is that, as we'll see in the future, that if everyone ate bacon, there'd be more cancer than if no one did. And so we'll see the important differences between causation on an individual level, like what will bacon do to me, and causation in populations. Namely, when you talk about bacon being a carcinogen, talking about how that would affect an entire population. And again, the individual stuff is stuff we do every day, like figuring out how stuff works. And then the causation in populations is more sciencey stuff. Unless you've got like a big budget and a research lab, you're, you probably wouldn't be doing that type of stuff every day. At least until you get into a you know, profession that, that does that. So to recap, we've got the two main flavors of arguments, the deductive, the inductive. Deductive arguments are either valid or invalid, sound or unsound. He thinks to know there would be, concepts would be deductive, Valid, invalid, sound, unsound. With the inductive arguments, they're either strong or weak. <coughs> so key concepts there, inductive, strong, weak. Now, we'll close looking at the notion of you know, proof and confidence. And we have different levels of, you know, depending on the context, as I mentioned before, different levels of values in terms of tolerance of accepting arguments, risk, etc. Now, in some cases, 
the required level of proof is set by people in authority or power. So for example, to give a very concrete example, in our legal system, the decision was made for various you know, ethical, practical, you know, political reasons to require, in the case of criminal trials, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that is inductive level proof because proof beyond all possible doubt would require a sound argument. Namely, you've got it, it's valid, you know all premises are true, so the conclusion must be true. And that would probably be, if you take uh, skepticism at least semi-seriously, that would probably be impossible because you could always bring up something that would give non-zero doubt. I mean, it could be incredibly, insanely implausible, but not logically impossible. For example, it could be possible that um, the crime is committed by someone from a parallel universe that looks exactly like the accused person. You know, wildly implausible, but not scientifically impossible. And you can think of other you know, totally bizarre scenarios. So obviously, in the legal system, we don't require an absolute certainty because you'd never get that. Instead, what is required is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is essentially requiring a strong inductive argument whose premises are probably probably true. And so beyond a reasonable doubt would, would not be deductive certainty, but really sure. So sure you would say, well, yeah, it, this could be wrong, but the only way you'd think it was wrong would be if you brought in like really weird and unreasonable cases like, you know, aliens or or you know an incredibly complex framework. Now, of course, you could still be wrong. And in, even if, in our legal system, even if people are doing it conscientiously, doing everything appropriately, things could still be wrong because it's still inductive reasoning. So deductive proof would be, again, a sound argument, which would be the highest possible standard. As a practical matter, we decide to put into place you know, lower standards. Now, again, in terms of like how strong does it have to be, again, it depends on values of the situation, and what's at risk, what's at stake, etc. So in the criminal system, the reason why we set the standard so high is because of a philosophical view. And the view is, at least in theory, that it is better that the guilty go free than the innocent be punished. So we set the standard very high. Now if our concern was different, if our philosophy was, it's better that the innocent be punished than the guilty go free, then we'd lower our standard. Because we'd be more concerned about not punishing the innocent, we'd be more concerned about punishing the guilty. And so what level of strength is required for the argument to be strong enough, again, rests a lot on, on values, assessments of risk and tolerance and political and moral values. So pretty messy stuff. So next time, we'll pick up looking at uh, the uh, unstated premises again. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on the Thursday.